Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hola. Good evening. Good morning. Whatever time it is. Okay. It's great to see you all here tonight. I'm glad everyone here can make it. Uh, this time, I'll ask that you take out your hymn books and stand if you're able as we sing our chorus of the week, 134. 134 on that chorus. Go tell it on the mountain. 134. Just the chorus. We stand if you're able as we sing. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. All right. Great singing tonight so far. All right. Our next hymn for tonight will be 148. 148. 148. Away in the manger. We'll sing all three verses. 148. Well, I want to welcome everybody here tonight. I'll tell you what, it's been a great day today. Amen? Amen. We had a great morning and we're going to have a great night tonight. It's good to have everybody here. But let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, thank you so much for today. We thank you for your love. Thank you most of all for sending your son to die on the cross. Father, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity of coming back and worshiping one more time today. We just pray now that you'll help us that when we leave this place tonight, we'll say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. We love you. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Our next hymn will be 144. Wait, yes. 144. Yeah, 144. Yes, uh, 100%. 90%. 144. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, when your virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep. 
phrases uh, I would not like to share. We're finally on break. After nine weeks, we made it. It's no school for two weeks. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm pretty excited about it, so I guess. Thanks. Amen. Yes, ma'am. That's the Oh, cool. nice. That's pretty good memory, though. Praise God for that. Yeah. Nice. Oof. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Yes, sir. Amen. It is good. It's great to see them. Amen. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. With his grace. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We are getting close to another anniversary on Cana. Amen. Wait, wait, what? Yeah. Uh, Amen. Yeah. The anniversary of what? What? The anniversary of what? Well, oh, wow. Transplant. Praise God. First of January. Yeah. Nice. Well, we're getting there. Wow, wait, so it's been a year? Wow, praise God. Amen. 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 Praise God for that. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. Nice. God is good. I guess so. Amen. Yeah, he is. Amen. Yeah, it is. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Huh? Uh, praise God, that sounds really nice. Amen. Yeah. Does anyone else? Uh, yeah, you, met, you met a lot of them? Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. Uh, does, anyone, uh, so does anyone else have a phrase they'd like to share before we move on to announcements? Yes, sir. Well, I was just thinking again, two years ago this week, I stood in front of you all crying very emotionally uh, because uh, I didn't know yet if I was going to get a heart transplant or anything. And uh, it was a pretty rough time for the first couple of weeks of uh, the last couple of weeks of 2017. So uh, thank you again for all the prayers. And uh, it just shows that prayer is deeper than Amen. words that I put on. Amen. Amen. Does anyone else have a phrase they'd like to share? Thanks. 
If not, then at this time we will have announcements by Pastor Storm. I love having Abbott up here. That way I don't have to stand up by myself. Amen. Amen. All right. We've got a lot of things coming up. We've got Sunday school at 9 o'clock, Sunday morning worship at 10. Uh, we have our um, Wednesday evening service. This week will be on Tuesday night uh, because of Christmas being on Sunday. And um, then we'll have, um, so we're going to have it on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. And Tuesday night, Wednesday's Christmas. He said Sunday. Oh, did I? Oh, okay. Let's start all over. We just rewound it. Um, Christmas Eve service on December the 24th. Okay, 6 o'clock. Then uh, the 25th is Christmas Day. Uh, 29th is Noisy Bucket. January the 3rd is the Adult Christmas Party. January 4th is our fun shoot at uh, Ben Avery for the uh, kids. Also, um, December the 6th, we're back to school. December, January 10th, not December, January 10th is uh, Tug. January 11th is Men's Breakfast. January 11th is also Movie Night. Um, January 18th is Fellowship, Men's Fellowship, and Ladies' Fellowship. The 18th is also Trap and Skeet Practice. Uh, January 19th is our missionary, the real missionary here uh, in the morning. Then January 24th and 25th is the Teen Conference at Valley Baptist Church. January 26th is Noisy Bucket. And Mark Gray will be here that morning, and that evening will be our annual business meeting. So we got a lot of things coming up. What? What? Huh? Oh no, that it's not missionary Mike, Mark Gray. Mark Gray won't be here until the twenty sixth, so it's not missionary Mark Gray. I didn't. Yeah. Oh, no. All right. Anyway. So that's what's coming up and going on. Yeah. Oh, the missionary. I don't, hang on, let me see what his name is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't look at that until I get to the 19th. Too many other things between now and then. Chris King. Missionary Chris King. The what? Christmas Eve, 6 o'clock. Yeah, 6 o'clock. Yep, 6 o'clock. Yep, we got her. All right. Any other questions or corrections to my announcements? I need a motion to accept the announcements. All right, we got, we got, we have a, a motion. I need a second. Any, okay, we got a second. All in favor say aye. Okay. Motion pass. Announcements are done. Amen. 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 Wait, that's my email. Thank you. Okay, now that our business meeting is done, at this time we'll, it is time for our course of the month. Please stand if you're able as we sing 27. 27. 27. Please stand. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Kingdoms with 
One more time. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Amen. Amen. Him tonight before the message will be 136. 136. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 136. There's a song in the air, there's a star in the sky, there's a mother's deep prayer, and the babies will cry. by Pastor Storm. All right. Turn your Bibles, if you will, tonight to the book of Acts. Book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. I'm going to look at something a little bit different. It's not, doesn't have anything to do with Christmas, but it's something that's been weighing on, ha, very heavy on my heart for the last two, three, four months. And um, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to preach about it. That way it'll be off my heart. Amen. <laughs> and uh, so Acts chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 41 to 47. It says, then they were greatly received his word, were baptized, and on the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they confirmed steadfastly in the apostle doctrine and fellowship <clears throat> and of the breaking of bread and in prayer.
prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and every wonder and the signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, and every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and signals of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for all that you've done for us. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct everything done here, that it'll be for your honor and your glory. Father, I want to be a help to the people tonight, and I know that if they listen intently, they'll get something out of this message that they can use in their own lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The title of tonight's message is A Growing Church. A growing church. Well, what causes a church to grow? If we water it and put fertilizer on it, it grows. Amen? That's why you have me as a pastor. Yeah, you, you know, I'm a farmer. Amen? But, huh? All right. But what does it take, though, to see a church continue to see souls saved and the church grow for the honor and glory of the Lord. I believe that there's far too many churches today that are spinning their wheels and not going anywhere fast because they want to do everything that everyone else is doing. They want to have the worship teams. They want to have church whenever they feel like it. They want to do this. They want to do that. And I believe that they're doing things completely wrong. They have too many things many times going on, and nothing is for the honor and glory of God. But what exactly is a church? What exactly is a church? Well, definition of a church is this. A church is called an assembly of people with like faith and doctrine. It is uh, the Lord's house or a place of worship. You know, each of us here are a part of a church. Everyone who's sitting in here who's a member of Florence Baptist Church is a member or part of this church. And you are part of this assembly and a collective body of Florence Baptist Church. You know, we're here for the common purpose to worship God. Amen? That's what we're here for. We're here to worship God and to get edified and built up with the Word of God. But what exactly is a called out assembly and, uh, to do as a collective church? What are we supposed to do? What's our job? I'm glad you asked that question. I really am. The Bible commands every believer to be a soul winner. Did you know that? There's not one of us in there that's not commanded to be a soul winner. After all, Jesus says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Listen, we're all to be soul winners. We're to take and win as many as we can to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the individual command, not for preachers only, not for Sunday school teachers only, not for bus workers only, but for everybody in the local New Testament church. But I believe... There's some very important things that we need to look at about the local church and what we need to do in 2020 to continue to see this church grow for the honor and glory of God. The first thing is this, and I believe wholeheartedly this is the most important thing that a church can do. Number one is this. A church needs to pray. A church needs to pray. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. You know, what we see here is that Peter was in prison. James had just been beheaded. 
He had just had his head taken off, and Peter was the next one in line to have the same thing done to him. But the church, notice there, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Listen, they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for the release of Peter. And we know that um, a praying church, believe it or not, gets action done. The church prayed for him without ceasing. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The church needs to be on its knees and pray for the things of the church. We need to pray for Florence Baptist Church. We're not going to grow if we don't have prayer warriors praying for this church. We need to pray for the finances. We need to pray for the missionaries. We need to pray for the pastor and his wife. We got to pray for each other. We got to pray for the ministries of the church. We need to pray for the vision of the church. And you know what? We need to pray for our government leaders. The church needs to pray. We need to pray. <clears throat> we have not because we what? Ask. ask not. We have not because we ask not. You know, too many times people say, well, God's not uh, uh, giving me what I want. Did you ask him for it? Did you ask him for it? Listen, we need to realize that God will answer our prayers. You know, if a church is not a prayerful church, it will go to and fro and not do anything for the cause of Christ. I guarantee it. You know, it will grow stale and will not grow for the honor and glory of the Lord. It will not be a great church and do mighty things for God. This next year, we're going to see some changes made in our prayer meeting. We're going to have some different things happening on our Wednesday night prayer meeting. Believe me, it's going to be a prayer meeting. It's not going to be a social time. Amen? Amen. Second thing is this. We need to be a church that ordains people. We need to be a church that ordains people. What do you mean by that? Well, people that feel like God has called them into the ministry, we as a church need to ordain them. Missionaries, especially, Acts chapter 13, verse 3, it says, And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. That's talking about Paul and Barnabas. Listen, the church ordained them to go out preaching as missionaries. But we also need to take and ordain pastors. In Titus chapter 1, verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders, which is pastors, in every city as I had appointed thee. You know, there is a process in which a person has to go through in order to get ordained. You can't go on the internet and just type something in there and they'll send you a certificate that says you're ordained. By the way, there was a lady in the church that wanted to see if she could do that or not, and she did, and she was. You know, she had the certificate that said, hey, I'm an ordained preacher. Wrong. This is, the, this is what has to happen to be ordained. Number one is this. He needs to be a, examined. The candidate needs to be examined. A pastor will call for a council of men, usually pastors, and some laymen um, who have a good understanding of the Bible and will examine this person, this man, to see if they're qualified to become ordained or they are not. Now, I can remember in my ordination, I remember it as it was yesterday. It was one of the most trying times of my life. Good friend of mine, Brother Blanchard, Greg Blanchard, he was an evangelist, 
great soul winner. I said to him, I said, Brother Blanchard, what do I need to know to get ordained? My ordination was coming up in about two months. What do I need to know? I hadn't went to college. I had no idea. And uh, at least not college for, for, um, to be a pastor. And he says, well, I'll get you some books. He come walking into church the next Sunday, and he had a stack of books this high. He says, read through these, and he says, you should be okay. I said, what? He says, read through these, and you should be okay. I said, are you kidding me? I was working full time. I, had, I mean, you know, and I was studying my Bible all the time and stuff. I said, read through these, and I'll be okay. He goes, yeah. He said, you'll be all right. He said, go ahead and read through all these. Well, there had to be 10,000 pages there. I said to him, I said, okay. Because I, you know, I wanted to make sure that I knew what I needed to know. I started reading through these books, and man, I read and read and read and read and read and read and read. And finally, about a week later, I come back to church with all these books. He says, you done with them already? I put them down. I said, yep. He says, man, you're a fast reader. I said, you bet. He said, what did you learn? I said, I learned that I don't agree with anybody in any of those books. I don't agree with them. I said, there's certain things I agree on, but I don't agree on every point in those books. He says, you're ready for ordination. I said, what do you mean? He says, I want you to come to the conclusion that man is man. And he held up his Bible and he said, God is God. He said, you trust this, don't trust that. And you know, I remembered that. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Came into my ordination council, sat down, and Brother Echoes probably had the same thing happen to him. Men sitting around in there that had been preachers for years and years and years. I had, uh, uh, let's see, there was uh, Brother Blanchard there, Dr. Um, Greg Blanchard. There was uh, Dr. Um, Bakash. Bakash was there. I had Dr. Uh, um, Let's see, uh, Munson there. We had, uh, I mean, these guys were all doctor, had doctorates, earned doctorates in theology. And Dr. Bakash, he was a Greek and Hebrew scholar who had a doctorate in Greek. And I'm sitting there sweating profusely. I'm thinking to myself, this is not going to be good. And so they started questioning me and questioning me and questioning me and questioning me. And I had most of the answers. Finally, Brother Bakash, he looked at me and he asked me a question about some Greek something. I can't even remember what it was. And I looked right at him and I said, you know what? I said, I don't know what that answer is, but I'll look it up and see if I can find it for you. He said, that's the answer I'm looking for. Got ordained. But boy, I'll tell you what, I sweat like butcher, man. It was unbelievable. But, you know, listen, they need to, a person needs to be examined by your peers. They need to be examined to see if they're worthy of being called a preacher. I have, um, then he needs to be presented. Now, it's not the ordination council that ordains. All they do is the examining. Then it comes before the whole church. The church is the ordination body. It's the church who ordinate, ordains a person. They come before the church, and I'm sitting up in front, and they open it up to the people of the church to ask questions. And you sit there, and you ask, answer questions from the people of the church. And then the church determines whether or not you will be ordained. And it goes to the, to the vote, and the church has to vote on it. Then there's a laying on hands. All of the men that um, uh, were in your council come around, and they pray over you and put their hands on you and pray over you. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, it, it, um, being ordained is a very sacred thing, and it cannot 
be taken lightly. It can't. You know, this fly-by-night ordination that people have nowadays is, is not right. It just isn't. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 40, it says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, they, come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee being hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in? And naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least. Listen to this very carefully. I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. Ye have done it unto me. You know, by those verses, there's a lot of things we need to do. Number one is we need to feed the hungry. We need to feed the hungry. You know, we need to realize that it's so very important to feed the hungry. Because we're, we're told to do that. You know, I truly believe that is one of the biggest reasons why... Florence Baptist Church has survived for the last 21 years. It is because we've had the food bank. We've fed the hungry. You know, the food bank ministry many times just really gets me because it's a lot of work. But, you know what, it's there because we are commanded to do that. You know, ministry should not be a profit center. It should not be a profit center. You know, we should be able to take and break even if we can but it should not be a profit center. We need to feed the hungry, not only physical food, but we need to feed them spiritual food. We need to see as many um, as we possibly can at the food bank come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We need to see that. Then we need to give them water. We need to give them drink. You know, I realize that there's a... Um, there's a lot of people, especially in the summertime, who need water. And they come here for water, and we're able to take and give them water. Jesus said in Mark 9, 41, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. You know, we need to show ourselves friendly to all those who come into this church. Amen? We need to show ourselves friendly to everybody that comes in this church. I realize there are those who are out to scam the church. I realize there are those who feel that everything that's in the church belongs to them. But we need to treat everybody fr friendly that comes to this church. You know, I also realize that we need to be cautious with what God has given us, but we need to be friendly to those who come to this church. <laughs> I'm going to give you a good example of that, and that's Robert and Brittany Gray. Brittany told me, she says, the first time we came to this church, she said, we walked in, I looked at Robert, and I said, I'm leaving. And he goes, Why? He says, she says, it's a small church. She says, they're all old people. And I, I started laughing. But he, she said, you know what? After we were here one service, and we saw the friendship and the love that the people have in this church, she says, I can't stay away from here. I can't. I can't stay away from this place. There's just a love about here that, that we never had in any of the other churches we've ever been in. And that's what we need. 
That's what Florence Baptist Church is all about. Then we need to take people in. You know, I think this is one of the areas my wife and I have been criticized on the most over the years. Just opening up our home and letting people move in and live with us. You know, when we, the first 10 years that we had the church, I don't think of those 10 years we had a year that we didn't have somebody living with us that was in the church, that didn't have a place to go. You know, I think of Toby Salas. Toby, he lived with us for almost a year and a half. I think of um, uh, the guy that, there's a guy that uh, worked on construction, and he lived with us, and, wow. and yeah, Bob. And um, so, I mean, we've always had kids, you know, mom and dad, you know, they came to school, mom and dad couldn't uh, pick them up every night, so they camped out at our house. And uh, we raised a lot of people's kids over the years. And, um, um, you know, but you know what? If, if there's a kindred spirit and you know that a person is saved, we as a church are obligated to help this person out. We are. We're obligated to help them out. You know, whether it's a motel or help with apartment, or what it is, we need to take and help them out. The next thing is this, we need to take and clothe those who need it. We need to put clothes on the back of those who need it. You know, we get in an awful lot of clothes here, and we've always got clothes around here for people. We need to be ready to have clothes on hand when people need them and, and we have them available. You know, there are many in this area who need clothes. You know, the Sheriff Department many times will call us and they'll say, hey, we have a family that's in need of whatever. Can you help them out? And nine times out of ten, we'll say, yeah, we can. And we do, and we help them out. You know, this is what the church is all about, and, and trying to help the need of those who need it. You know, to give without feeling there's going to anything come back in return. You know, here a while back, we had a, um, I got a, a letter in the mail, and it was from a guy, I had no, I can't even remember who he is, but he knew who we were, and he says, you may not remember me, but he says, about eight years ago, my wife and I and my three kids were living out by the river, and we would come in to the food bank three times a week. That's when we run on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we would get enough food to last us till the next food bank. And he said, if it would not have been for you and your church and what you did for us, we probably would have starved. He says, now we're back on our feet again. We're, uh, I got a job. My wife has a job. We've got a really nice house we were able to buy. We've got a nice car. The kids are in a good school. And he said, this is just a little token of our appreciation. And it was a check in there for quite a sum of money. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, praise the Lord. You know, listen, that's thankfulness. You know, they got back on their feet. That's what it's all about. You know, we're to take and clothe those who need it. We need to take and visit the sick. You know, the church needs to have a caring heart to those who are in the hospital. You know, if you're in the hospital, we're going to visit you. If we know you're there. Amen. You know, this is the thing that just irks me to no end. It does. I mean, if, there, if there's anything that makes me more disgruntled, it's this. Huh? I know. And is people go to the hospital and they don't call and let me know they're in the hospital. We had a, a lady that went to church here for, oh, quite a while. And one day she came in and she slammed the door. We're getting ready to start service. She slammed the door, come stomping up, sat right there, and just glared at me. And I'm thinking, I got to get this taken care of before I get behind the pulpit because this is not going to be good. I went over to her and I said, something wrong? She looked right at me and she says, I was in the hospital for two weeks 
and you never came and saw me. Everybody in the church heard it. I said to her, I said, well, I said, when were you in the hospital? She says, last week and the week before. I said, well, did you tell anybody you were in the hospital? She goes, well, no, but you should know it. <laughs> You're the pastor of the church. I said, well, I said, I'm sorry, but nobody told me that you were in the hospital. And you didn't tell me you were in the hospital. So I didn't know you were in the hospital. She quieted down. Now, that was one of the best sermons I ever made in my entire life. Listen, if I don't know a person's in the hospital, I can't visit them. I, you know, yeah, I work for God, but, you know, sometimes he just does not tell me everything that's going on. You know, I try to get up and do hospital visits as often as I possibly can. And Dana can be a test of that. And, uh, <laughs> yep. But also, we need to take and visit those who are in prison. You know, uh, this is not talking about just any prisoner. This is talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. Something happens, and they get incarcerated. We need to take and go visit them. You know, across the country, there are many who have been put in prison for preaching the gospel, believe it or not. And I know of one man and his son who were passing out tracks across the street from the Mormon temple in Mesa during Christmas. And people would come up to him and start talking to him, and he's just preaching right on the street, right across the street from the Mormon temple. The Mormons got a little bit upset. They called the police. Him and his son got arrested for disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace. The charges were dropped. But you know, Dr. Gibbs from Christian Law, in many of his newsletters, shares cases that they're working on because people are put in prison for what they preached behind the pulpit. You know, we need a prison ministry to go in and see our brothers and sisters in Christ in prison. Not only that, but we need to care for our widows. We need to care for our widows. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. In Acts 6, 1, it says this, And in those days when the number of disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in daily menstruation. Listen, we need to have a widow ministry. We do. We've got a lot of widows in this church. We do. You know, I look at Betty. I look at uh, uh, Mary. I look at uh, uh, some of the other ones in the church. And we've got widows in the church. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I go to visit them as often as I can, Sarah. I, and, and, but I just, sometimes there's more or less hours in the day than I have. Let's put it that way. You know, we need to have a widow ministry. We need to take and have people who can go and visit. If nothing else, just go and say, hey, how you doing? Have a word of prayer with them and leave. You know what I mean? Just to show that we're there. And we need to look out for those children without parents or without a mom and dad. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 5, it says, And who shall receive one of one such little child in my name receiveth me? You know, in the area that we live in, we live in... Let's put it this way. In a very unique situation. I'll put it that way. How's that? 
If you look at the number of single parents in this area who mom is trying to raise four or five kids, dad's over in prison, or dad maybe up and took off, or mom maybe took off, and mom or dad or grandpa and grandma are trying to raise those children. You know, it's up to us collectively as a church to take and help them out as much as we possibly can. Food, clothes, toiletries, things like that. They, they need all of that. And we as a church need to fill that need. If we want to be a growing church, we have to take and do these things. You know, <clears throat> there are so many broken homes today with uh, uh, the drugs and alcohol and, and money problems, marital problems. And many of them end up in divorce and kids living with one parent and another parent living someplace else. But in our society we live in today, 80% of all the children live in a broken home right now. Did you know that? 80%. 80% of children do not live with both biological parents. That's atrocious. Any animal can have an offspring, but it takes a parent to raise them. Amen? Amen. You know, I know what it's like to raise children. <laughs> Believe me. We raise them every day. But you know, if we want as a church to continue to grow, we need to do these things. We need to show people that we love them. We need to show people that we're there for them. If we have a lot of programs which do absolutely nothing, all we're doing is spinning our wheels. All we're doing is spinning our wheels. It takes every one of us in this local body of Florence Baptist Church to keep this church running and keep this church growing as God would have it to grow. There's not one of us here who's a member of this church or has been a member for any period of time that does not know what we do around here. And this a lot. We do an awful lot. For a small church like we are, we do an awful, awful lot. But there's one other area that we need to have, and that's love. We need to have love for each other. After all, when Jesus was here on earth, why was it the disciples continued to follow him? Was it because of his miracles? No. Was it because they got paid a lot of money? It was because Jesus showed them love. Jesus showed them love. And that was love they could get, not get anywhere else. You know, I, I want everyone in here to understand this. I love you. I want you to know that. Your pastor loves you. Unconditionally. I love each and every one of you. And I'd do anything for any of you. I would. I would. You know, that's the kind of love that we need to show the people around Florence is the love that this church has for each other and for them in the community. You know, the late Dr. Jack Heil said this. He said, a church will never survive if the pastor does not love his people. A church will never survive unless the pastor does not love his people. You know, there's an awful lot of churches that I've been in that I don't feel love. I don't. You walk in and, oh yeah, people shake your hands. But there, there's not that love there. When people walk through these doors, they feel loved. They do. And that's what we have to have. If we want this church to grow this next year, we need to have that love relationship with everybody that comes to this church. 
And if we do that, and we get on our knees and we pray, as a collective body, I guarantee that this church is going to go forward like we've never seen before in this next year. We just need to remember that this church is not my church. This is your church. All I am is a preacher standing up here preaching what God lays on my heart every Sunday morning, Sunday night. This isn't Brother Echo's church. He's our evangelist. You know, we're here to minister to you. And through us, we hope that you can grow spiritually. Some of you may not grow spiritually, right, Chuck? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what we need to realize is this, is that in order to be in a collective body, we first have to be what? Saved. And we have to be baptized. You know, there's one thing about this church. People can come in and find the Lord. Amen? Amen. You know, I was thinking tonight of your, your uh, motorcycle accident that you had and how close you came to death. And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, man, when William told me about the accident, I thought to myself, I wonder where he would have spent eternity if something would have happened to him. Because I'd never met him before. You know, what we need to realize is that we're all sinners, aren't we? The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that there's a penalty for our sin, for the wages of sin, or the penalty of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What we need to realize is that because of our sin, we can't go to heaven. That's the penalty. But Jesus died for us on the cross. God commended his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for every one of us in this room. And all we have to do is ask for it. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, not might be saved, shall be saved. That is an assurance that we can take to the bank. Amen? Amen. We can all know for sure if something would happen to us where we would spend eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for this message of this growing church. I just pray, Father, that you take and be with the, us tonight. Help us and guide us. Father, I just pray now that you'd be with this invitation. With every head bowed and every eye closed for just a minute. and Maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, you know, preacher, I'm not 100% sure what would happen to me if I were to die tonight. If something would happen, I would drop over dead. I have no idea where I would spend eternity. Would you pray for me? I just want to pray for you. Just raise your hand quickly, quietly, and put it down. Anyone at all. I just want to pray for you. Yes, I see that hand. Anyone else? Father, you've seen the hands. You know the hearts. I don't know the hearts. I just pray for the hands that were raised tonight, Lord. I just pray that you would somehow, some way, help us to be able to show them from your, your word how they can know for sure they're on their way to heaven. I just pray now that you'll be with us, guide and direct in the rest of this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, turn your hymnals, if you will, to number 157 as uh, Abed comes and leads us in a couple stanzas. Jesus made it all, fall to him a 
just know. Father, I just thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for your love. We thank you for this message. And Father, we just thank you so much for loving us and giving us a way that we can be sure that we're on our way to heaven. Father, we love you. We thank you for this holiday season. We just pray now that as we leave this place, we'll remember the reason for the season. For we know that you came to this earth for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to die on the cross for our sins. And we just thank you so very much. I just pray now that as we leave this place that your grace will be upon each and every one of us as we, as we go. Help us and guide us. Bring us back to our appointed place on Tuesday night for our Christmas Eve service. And we'll give you the praise and the thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need food, we got food out in the back. And... Um, Yes. Yeah.